My name is Julianne Martinez, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you all here today and to welcome uh, the presenter this morning, Kelly Howard. Uh, as you might have heard if you were here this morning for John Wilton in the opening remarks, this conference is really uh, the brainchild of Kelly Howard, Inet Dishler, who's also in the room, Sid Real. So staff members, just like you, who are looking for new career paths, wanting to chart their own way. And so the talk this morning by Kelly will really go all over those kinds of things for you. Kelly uh, is now at UCOP. She, uh, she'll be starting her uh, 12th month there soon. Uh, but she had worked on campus at Cal for quite a few years, for seven years, in talent acquisition in human resources. So again, welcome and welcome Kelly Howard. Um, it is to say that I've been at, at UCOP for um, almost a year and to come back to the Berkeley campus um, in a short period of time has been a real, a real joy and a real honor for me to do that. Um, this uh, NOW conference, Next Opportunity at Work, was something that we thought of, you know, several years ago and um, Sid and the team actually pulled it off and it's great and I'm very honored to actually be here to, to speak with you today. What I'm going to talk to you today about is career pathing at UC, and we're going to have some conversation about the way that the compensation structure has changed over the last couple of years, and how to use that to find other career opportunities within uh, UC Berkeley. And so, to begin, I want to just kind of uh, take us um, into, you know, where we are right now as far as our careers go. I'm going to just sit this water down. I've got a little tickle, so excuse me if I, if I cough. If we could just kind of um, take a look at, you know, what, what, who's actually in the room right now, that would be great. For those of you who have actually been at uh, UC Berkeley working for 25 years, if it is a raise of hands, could you just show me who you are by a raise of hands if you've had 25 years of work experience? What about 15 years? Okay. 10 years? All right. Five? Ah, oh, and then anywhere between one to three. Awesome, very good. So we're all at different points in our career here at UC Berkeley. So this is going to be good. Um, we're going to, I'm going to talk about some tips and some things that you can consider. And you can use it in any way you like because you're all at different points in your, in your actual career. So what I'd like to do now is um, tell you just a little bit about um, someone who's actually um, done some pretty cool things in their career at a very young age. And I would like to t ask you the question, you know, what does it mean to be a risk taker? Um, Vice Chancellor Wilton mentioned this morning that it's important to, to take risk, but take, you know, educated risks, basically, and know your options and know what's involved in the risk taking that you do. So I'm going to show, take just a moment to start off our, our workshop with a little video of, of a girl who's 11 years old. And I want you to think about what's happening in the video and think about the question that I ask you. What does it mean to be a risk taker? And then we're going to come out of the video, have a little dialogue and conversation, and then move into the rest of the workshop. OK? Unexpected formatting issues can Some occur when can you email your resume to an employer. If you feel caught These off guard by a can question, be a major just turnoff. take a moment. Spend a minute converting your resume you into a PDF. We'll That'll ensure your formatting looks the same on every computer. All hail the mighty PDF. When you compare Brooke to the average climber that's her age, there almost is no comparison. I'm Brooke Robitu. I'm when 11 years old and I'm a rock climber. When you compare Brooke to the average climber I started that's her climbing age, there almost is no comparison. I'm Brooke Robitu. I'm 11 years old and I'm a rock climber. The hardest route out there. She wants to win the competitions. I She's able to do climbs probably that probably people about once I thought were impossible. She wants to climb when the I'm hardest on a high route rock out there. She wants to win the competitions. She's able to do climbs that people once thought were impossible. On a high rock, I feel I'm in control and just happy.
We only just probably about when I could walk. She wants to climb the hardest route out there. She wants to win the competitions. She's able to do climbs that people once thought were impossible. When I'm on a high rock, I feel I'm in control and just happy. I'll go first. Brooke is a climbing phenom. She's set all these precedents in rock climbing that um, 10 years ago, the top elite climbers were having trouble doing. Brooke is um, one of two female climbers in the world at the young age of 11 to be setting records. Brooke was the first nine-year-old to do V10. She was also the first 10-year-old to do V11. She was the first 10-year-old to climb 514A and the first 11-year-old to climb 514B. You're talking like 0.0001% of the climbing community that can do these climbs. I love climbing because, well, there's a lot of challenges in climbing. I don't know, it seems so cool just to be doing moves after moves and different holds. There's so many different ways that you can climb. I want you to watch how I take the hold. I'm going to take it open and then I'm going to close it. Take it open and then close it. Open and then close it, okay? Brooke really has the full package. For one, she has these incredibly strong fingers. If she gets a hold, she's going to hold on to it. Also, she's been able to maintain that almost baby flexibility where she's able to twist and turn into these positions that the average climber is just not able to do. Brooke is also unique in the sense that she comes from this long line of champion World Cup climbers. I started climbing at 18 and I did my first World Cup in 1989 and I went on to win four World Cup titles in a row. That pretty much set my path for what I wanted to do as an adult, which was to coach and teach young kids how to rock climb. It's all about bringing in with one arm. Now she coaches me and my teammates. She encourages me a lot. She gives me really good advice. She's just a big part of my climbing life. There it is, kiddo. Good, strong. Yeah, Brooke. She's hard on herself, so I don't need to be hard on Brooke. She's her boss. And I'm always there to give her just the tools that she needs to help her progress to the level that she wants to be at. Sometimes it's hard for my mom to be my coach because I can get really frustrated with her. Come on, faster, Brooke. Let's go. Come on, Brooke. Good. Go, 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 go. Last, you can, oh, you could have gotten another second off there. Robin is an intense person, but that's uh, what makes her great. And I think that the kids thrive off of that intensity and that desire to succeed. Really pull hard. Yes, Brooke. Good. Yeah, sweet. That's progress. Come on, Brooke, you get more in. Again. To be a really good climber, you can't just have it. You have to train really hard, so. I take it pretty seriously. One time. <laughs> nice job. We have kids that are athletic, and they've been athletic since you know the day they started to crawl, and you can see that they're very coordinated. As a family, we introduced our kids to climbing at a very young age. We started when they were itty bitty. We lived in France and we have a climbing gym in our backyard. And as soon as they could walk, we tied them into a rope and we let them try to climb. It's something that's just always been in our lives. Just like, you know, the refrigerator and the bathtub, we've always had a climbing wall at our home. And this is my climbing, like, mini gym that my dad built and it's in my basement of my house. My dad was also a really good rock climber. He climbed in World Cups too. He won a lot of big competitions, but he doesn't climb much anymore. I did all the competition until 92. And after that, um, I kind of slowed down my climbing and, and find other passions. And now I like a lot to work with my hands, building stuff. I love it. My dad builds climbing walls and houses too. He built a lot of my house, and he also built a strength training part above my basement. It's just a kind of a European way of uh, gaining finger strength, and we like it, so we built it. Nice, 
I like to look for challenges. It keeps me motivated and I don't like doing the same thing all the time. We're in Clear Creek and the route I'm gonna climb is Sonic Youth. Brooke just steps way out there from a challenge standpoint and she picks things that are hard for her and hard for anybody and she goes after it. Because climbing's so hard, it's almost a masochistic sort of sport. If it doesn't make you happy, then there's no reason to do it. When I'm on a really high climb, and I look out at the view or down. I know the view is almost always really pretty and fascinating. And when I look down, I'm not scared because I'm not scared of heights, but it's just so cool to think how small I am compared to the rock and how high I am. Come on, Ricky. You can do it. It's important to always be strong mentally. You let it slip for one second, especially because of the nature of climbing. It can be a dangerous sport if you let that enter into your mind that I can't do this or this is too hard. Sometimes when I reach a place where I don't think I can go any farther, it's always possible to do something. I just have to like try it. You just gotta commit to it, you can do it. Awesome. She doesn't go after things that come easy for her. She wants to climb the hardest route out there. She wants to win the competitions. And with that comes failure. Oh, wow, good effort. <laughs> it's hard as parents to see that happen, but it's important for all of us. We've all been there where things don't always fall into place and that's what makes us stronger. If I don't make a route, it's just motivating because I don't want to leave it undone. I'm so close, and it's just that feeling that I know I can get it. She has this persistence to keep going. I've, I've been with her outside trying these things well past after it's gone dark, and Brooke's still there fighting to do this rock climb. That tough, grinding personality that doesn't give up is really what makes her who she is. And it was there when she was itty bitty, and it's still there. I'm Brooke Rabatu. Hang around and watch the next video. So let's talk about what it means to be a risk taker. Um, it, is, it is definitely a, um, you know, I asked you the question, you know, what does that actually mean? You have to probably help me, I don't know. Um, what does that actually mean to be a risk taker? Um, Anybody want to comment on that? What, did, what does that video mean to you? What did you feel in that video? Don't give up. Anyone else? Yeah. You're going to fail before you succeed. You're going to fail before you succeed? Yes. Out of your comfort level, right. And there are lots of different things that Brooke said in that video that really kind of resonated with me in thinking about you, thinking about how you're gonna move forward in your career path here at UC. And some of the things she said, she says, you know, when I'm on that high rock and I'm in control, I'm happy. You know, I, that's a place that I'm really comfortable and I'm happy to do that. Um, and you know, she's at the top of her game and what she actually does at 11 years old. And her mom said, you know what, guess what? She's the boss. And I'm just here to give her the resources that she needs to keep moving forward. And so that's kind of what it's about it, it being at UC and thinking about your career. You're the boss. You're the boss of that career. Nobody's going to tell you, you know, what you should do next and how you should do it. You're the boss. You're the one that's making the decisions on what kind of challenges you're going you're gonna to have, what kind of experiences you're going to have, what kind of training that you need to move your career forward. The other thing that was very notable in the, in the conversation of the coach was that, you know, if it doesn't make you happy, there's no reason to do it. And so that makes her happy. 
And so that's what she does. And so that's what I want you to think about as we move through this conversation about career paths is what makes you happy. Because that's what you need to be doing on a day-to-day -day basis is something that makes you happy. Yes, we all need a job um, and we all need to have, you know, compensation for that job to have our families and live our lives outside of our job. But your job is an important piece of your life. And so you want to make sure you're taking the right risk and you're making the right choices and it is going to make you happy. So in the agenda today, we're going to um, talk a little bit about the three basic steps for career pathing. Of course, I don't know. I, I, I'm technically challenged as usual here. Um, it's not moving on me. Three basic steps to career pathing. We're going to talk a little bit about that. How can um, Career Compass um, help you navigate your UC career? And then how do people move around the UC? Um, you know, I started my uh, career in higher education here at UC Berkeley, and I was here for seven years, and now I'm at UCOP. And so um, I, I have made that transition, and I'll tell you a little bit about my career steps that I took. And then, you know, what I'm going to leave you with, you know, what is an action plan to actually put together so you can walk away with it in your hand and then take it back to your boss and have some conversation about it? Because as we start to build our career paths, and then we're going to hear some, uh, sorry, then we're going to hear some career um, stories um, that are really important. And my two speakers are actually here today, and they're going to talk to us a little bit about um, what we do and what we want to accomplish as we progress our, our career here at UC. And they're going to tell us about their experiences. So, you know, what is career pathing? You know, what is that word? That's a, like, our speaker earlier today talked a little bit about words we kind of make up in, in HR. Well, career pathing is just basically, you know, what do we want to accomplish in our career progression at UC? It's kind of understanding, you know, what your skills are, what your interests are, what do you value in the work that you do day to day to day, um, and, and also, you know, what other, um, accomplishments that you have. You have to be really solid and grounded in kind of understanding where your confidence level is in order for you to kind of make decisions on how are you going to actually move forward in the next step. Because if you don't know what your skills are, then it's going to be difficult for you to make that blend, take that, that educated risk, as we want to say. Um, and so in career pathing, um, we have three basic steps. There is the self-assessment step, um, and that's a little bit, like I just said, of getting to know who you are and what you are able to do and where your interests lie. And then there's the career pathing step um, of development, and there's two pieces to that. One is doing the research and kind of understanding where you want to go in your career and kind of knowing exactly you know, what type of, of, of job you want to do day to day on, on, a, on an everyday basis. And then also making some decisions and knowing how to connect with those individuals that might help you make the decisions to move on to the next step. And then the third step is, we're going to talk about is future job exploration. You know, how do you find out what's out there? And how do you um, make yourself educated on um, what a position in HR looks like versus a position in finance versus a position in um, IT? So under self-assessment, um, there are several things on this UC Berkeley campus that you can actually um, use. The UHS um, Tang Center has lots of different resources that can help you decide you know, where your interests lie. And number one, basically, is um, the Myers-Briggs and the Strong Inventory Test. Both of those tests can help you figure out where your interests lie right now. And you t maybe you took them, I know I took them when I came out of college, and then I you know, got into the workforce, and I took them again, because your interests and your values and those things actually change. And so you want to make sure you kind of are in touch with yourself and you know where you are. Um, you know, if you worked with, um, you're in a very collaborative environment currently in your job today, and then you move into a position where there's not a lot of collaboration, you got to know that that's maybe not the best move for you if you really like to be in a collaborative environment. And so you want to make sure you're researching those things. And then assessing your skills, abilities, and knowledge. Um, you want to, um, as, as we work day to day in our jobs, we do a lot of things. Um, and a lot of times we don't even realize how many projects that we're connected to, how many people that we're connected to, how many times we stretch ourselves in our jobs. 
And so you want to think about, you know, how, how you're doing that on a day-to-day -day basis and, and take note of it because that's going to be some of your, your elevator pitch and your speech as you move forward to the next position. And then take a look at the experiences and accomplishments that you've made in your position. Um, me just coming back to this campus and, and working this conference, I'm that little yellow folder that you all got, all you guys have in your hand, that's an accomplishment that I made in 2006. And so that is um, things that you, know, you don't really remember, but if you don't write them down and you don't take note in your career plan, you'll forget about them. And so you wanna make sure you're, you're paying attention to that. Any questions about self-assessment and making sure you understand you know, what your, where your interests lie? Um, one of the pieces that I, you know, I wanted to really stress is that you, know, you have to own this career development process that we're going to go take you through. And um, the responsibilities and the self-evaluations and the preparation that you do to move in your career is really important. Um, you need to make sure you're initiating the conversations as you're doing this self-assessment with your actual manager. Um, that manager uh, needs to know what, where, where you're going and what you're doing. It's not necessarily that that person's going to help you make those choices and put all the right things in front of you. That's your job. You need to make sure you're making the right connections, putting the right things, the right projects in your way. But your manager, if they don't know what your goals are and what you're, you're striving for, it's very difficult for them to you know, connect you with the right person or open up and say that, yes, you should be on that project. Or if they're in another meeting, thinking about you and what your goals are and maybe making those, helping you to make those connections. So it's really important that you keep them informed. Um, we're going to also talk about a creating an action plan as we move on um, that you can actually share with your manager. You can walk away and share that with them. So in career pathing, um, I talked a little bit about the resources that you can get at the Tang Center, um, and they are um, around you know, finding out what you want to do, what, what your interests are, where they lie. But you also need to think about where the positions are in the organization. And Career Compass was started about um, I guess 2009 was when we launched Career Compass here at UC Berkeley. And so it actually gave us an opportunity to see all the jobs within the organization. Prior to that, some, most of you are kind of at an at a, um, a earlier a, a stage in your career, and maybe you didn't know what our, our career structure looked like previously to that, and it was like 60 years old, the career structure we were working at. When I first came to this campus, I'm a recruiter at heart, and that's what I do. And so I can remember telling someone, hey, I've got this great HR analyst position in my, in my org. Why don't you go in the, uh, into the website and check it out? person called me back the next day, you, there's like 50 analyst positions at UC Berkeley. Like, how am I going to figure out which one you want to recruit me for? So this career compass that, that was created is really, really important. It actually tells you what's going on in the organization, what are those job fields and families, and then how do we actually mark, map, map ourselves to the marketplace? Because the comp competition out there is really com competitive, and it's pretty fierce, and so you need to know what you can do. And if you can't go into an interview, another interview, or meet, meeting another networking opportunity and say what you do, nobody can help you make those connections that you need to make, right? So if I go in and say, well, I'm an analyst at UC Berkeley, and I don't say I'm an analyst in HR, I could be an analyst in IT, I could be an analyst in finance, all of those apply. So this is really a really good thing that UC Berkeley has put together for, for us. And these are the resources to help you be the boss and move your career. So informational interviews are actually um, very important. Um, they are the inf interviews that you are actually running. If you find positions or you find individuals that are in different parts of the organization that you're interested in, I think it's okay. You can reach out to them and say, hey, I'd like to set up an informational interview. There's some classes at UHS that can actually teach you how to, how to do an informational interview because that's your job to do the informational interview. It should be about 20 minutes or so. Um, and you're going to ask the person, you know, why are you in this job? Um, what makes this job, you know, um, so great for you? Um, what do you do on a day-to-day -day basis? What are the challenges that you might experience in the position? Um, you know, who do you work with? How is the position structured? What is the organization like? All of those are good questions that you should be asking and doing your risk, your assessment. You want to be a risk taker, but again, you want to be an educated risk taker. You want to make sure you know what you're getting yourself into. Job shadowing is also a good thing that you can do if you are able to be on work groups and um, cross-functional cross, uh, things in the organization or actually in 
uh, your particular department, um, it gives you an opportunity to shadow people and, and see what they do. For instance, um, one of the stories that I uh, was telling with, uh, talking with someone about is that they wanted to be a project manager, but they didn't know how to facilitate um, a meeting and what, what it was all involved in facilitating that meeting. And so that person got a chance to actually accompany that other person into a meeting to see how they facilitated it. Experiences that you um, expand yourself with are important. Um, you need to be looking for those. Um, if you're able to get a mentor or be a mentor to someone, that's a wonderful experience. Um, my um, uh, two presenters that are gonna talk about their career success have actually you know, had the opportunity to be a mentor. Um, mentors are there to talk to you about your career and um, talk to you about the things or the challenges that you're having or the things that you wanna accomplish. And to say that UC Berkeley actually has that um, in, in the organization, you should definitely connect with it. It's been here for a while and it's a good resource. You also need to be looking at the trends that are going on in the organization. We um, had a little conversation this morning about shared service centers that are opening up. It's not just UC Berkeley that's trying to figure out how to work more efficiently and get things done more efficiently on this campus. This is something that's rolling out to lots of different companies and organizations. It's not something new. It's not something to necessarily, you know, have, you know, resist and say, oh, I don't want to be pegged into that box. Well, that box has lots of opportunities in it. And so you want to think about, you know, what does a shared service center look like? And what do, you know, what is that trend about? And how can I get involved and be involved in that trend? So in the career pathing and decision making, um, you know, the career objectives is, you know, what role do you actually want to play? in the organization. Um, you need to ask yourself, you know, what is that role? Do you want to be a part of uh, the organization that works with students on a day-to-day -day basis? Do you want to be a part of the organization that works more with the infrastructure of the organization? Those are important questions. And so we're going to talk a little bit about Career Compass and, and how actually Career Compass works so that we can talk about, you know, what positions would be a good fit for you. Um, again, like the organization, what are your interests, where, what departments do you want to be in? I have always worked in a central function in, on this UC Berkeley campus, but I've also been a very collaborative partner with different people in different organizations. So there is the Business School of Haas, there is um, Student Affairs, there is Employee Relations, uh, I'm sorry, sorry, um, University Relations. And so there's different ways and different kinds of uh, parts of the organization that are very different and offer lots of opportunities. And so you need to do some of your research and figure out where you want to land there. And then we talked a little bit about, is there any additional training that you might want to get? Um, if you decide that, you know, I do want to maybe be a part of a shared service center or I do want to work with students, there may be some additional training that you might need to, to do. I know that um, one of the initiatives um, last year, I think in 2012, was to allow un staff members to go and get classes at um, the extension, UC Berkeley extension. And so I know that I took advantage of that and my whole team took advantage of that when I was here on the Berkeley campus. And it was a wonderful experience. And we walked away and we went back and we created new cool and crazy things um, in employment. And so Bruce is trying to implement those now, I'm sure. Um, personally, and then what personally works for you and your family? Um, someone also mentioned, you know, maybe this is a time in your life um, that you are, have parents that are aging. Um, currently, I have somebody on our team that has older parents. She's kind of, she's in that sandwich generation. She's got, you know, children of her own who also have children, but she's also got to take care of her, her elderly parents. And so she's actually decided to take a step back in her career and what she's doing and decide to, to you know, I'm not going to do this on day to day. So I want to pick up some projects and do some other things within HR versus, you know, the high pace, high energy, being a business partner every day. And so you have to think about where you are in your life and what you're doing. There have also been times where I've had individuals come to me and say, you know what, I've got a new family now and I want to take a little bit of time to be with my family because I won't have that opportunity again. And so then that person also took a step back. And so there's different ways and different reasons why people do those things. And you should be aware of where you are in your current career right now. So let's go jump right in and talk about Career Compass. If I can turn the page. I guess it doesn't like me hitting that little button down there. Um, so in Career Compass, in front of you, you have a sheet that is blue and gold. It was created as a marketing tool um, for Career Compass. 
There are 27 different job um, fields and families, um, or 27 uh, different uh, fields, actually. It looks like this in front of you. And on that, it talks about the different field, and then underneath it, it has the families. Does everybody remember this career compass? Is everybody aware of career compass? No? Oh, okay. Okay. So this is a good, this is a good reflection. This is something that was created because I talked a little bit about that aging compensation uh, structure that we had. Well, Career Compass it has been in play, I guess, for, since 2009. And so um, we have some good information about people moving through their career in Career Compass. If you take a look at the document in front of you, for instance, let's just jump into finance. Finance is the field, you know, and that's the field that's mapped to the marketplace outside of Berkeley. Inside of that field, you'll find um, positions such as our families that are in, a, in the accounting field, the audit field, um, enterprise risk management, finance analysis, financial services, institutional research, payroll and purchasing. And so all of those things fall within that job field and family. And in the marketplace, those are the positions that those recruiters, the, the prior um, speaker that was speaking here, that's what the recruiters are looking for. They're not looking for the UC Berkeley analyst position. They're looking for, have you worked in accounting? Have you worked in finance? What are your experiences? What are your skill sets? And, and that's the reason why this was actually created. This was created on the UC Berkeley campus, but my organization, the Office of the President, is actually implementing this in April, almost to the day that we, in, that we implemented it here on Berkeley campus. But um, this means that not only do you know what the jobs are at UC Berkeley, but now you know what the jobs are at the Office of the President as well, because we're going to have the same job fields and family. Um, UC Merced actually implemented their career compass um, version, which is called Career Track as well, and, and that was in October of um, the, uh, 2012. Currently, right now, UCLA and the medical centers, they're all looking at this comp structure as well. So now, moving forward, as those, those organizations implement um, their career compass or their career track, um, you'll be able to see what jobs are in those organizations as well. You'll also be able to see, you know what, oh, guess what, I'm in finance or I'm in payroll, I probably shouldn't use payroll as an example, but I'm in, I'm in finance right now and I want to collaborate with somebody over at UCSF who has the same job as me because I've got this project and I'm trying to figure it out. Well, could you pick the phone up and call them? Yes, probably. Would you be able to find them today and know what position they're in? Probably not. But as we implement this um, different um, comp structure to all the different UCs, you'll have a better view and a better, clearer picture of what actually is going on. Um, if you take a look at once you get the job field and family um, on that, the way that it's structured is you have the job field, which is the group that, that is a general occupation. Then you have the family, which is a more specific field we just talked about. And then you have the categories that go across. Is it an operational technical position? Is it a professional position? Or is it a supervisory managerial position? And within each one of those categories are different levels. Okay, and so on, um, in HR, there is something called the Berkeley Career Builder, and the Career Builder has all of this information in it. So you can go there and you can look at it, you can see all the jobs, you can see all the different levels. This is kind of the career ladder we're talking about, right? Um, and so um, if you come in maybe at an entry level, level one position, you can take a look at what it is to be a level one. This is actually posted as well. It talks about, you know, as an entry level profession, um, there needs to be, there's limited or no prior experience that you're gonna need. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, you're gonna learn to use the professional concepts to resolve problems of limited scope, complexity, work on assignments that require limited judgment and decision making. Well, as you move through the different levels, the entry level, intermediate, experience, and advanced, it tells you what you need to be successful at each one of those steps, okay? And so um, as you move through those, you can start to think about, okay, I want to I wanna learn something else so that I can move up. As I'm an entry-level person coming in, I want to move up to be an experience level in the next two to three years. So what things do I need to put in my pathway in order to get me to that experience? And in that level, I'm going to be a journey-level person, experienced professional who knows how to apply theory and to put it into practice with full understanding of the professional and field. The broad knowledge and work, uh, excuse me, has broad, knowledge, uh, broad job knowledge and works problems on diverse scope. So maybe you want to do some training. Maybe you want to do some networking. Maybe those are going to be the things that are going to push you on and move you on to that next level. Any questions? Okay. 
So now we have this great little document that tells you all the jobs that are in the organization. If you flip it over, this is the job card. This is actually what the job card looks like, okay? Um, the example that's given there is the job title is Database Administrator 1. And so as a database administrator, one, it also tells you, you know, what is the custom scope and what is the generic scope? What do I need to have to be in this particular position? Um, the responsibilities are listed and the knowledge and skills is, are also listed on this particular job card. So you can take a look at what, is it, what are the responsibilities of the job. If I were to apply to the position, I could go into the Berkeley Job Builder and pull this job card up and I could actually see what kind of responsibilities this posi particular position has. I could then sit down with my manager and talk about the knowledge and skills that I need to acquire in my job right now today so that I can move on to this next step. Me, this is a, a direct career ladder going up the ladder. So the, the career path is actually listed at the bottom there. It says the career path from a database administrator one moves into a database administrator two. It's in the field of, um, uh, of information technology and the family is the database management, and what type of position it is, it's a professional position. Okay? I have a question. Sure. What is meant by used by recruiters? Used by recruiters. This is, in, in the following examples that we had a recruiter talk to us, this is what recruiters use to recruit. If I'm talking to a hiring manager, and the hiring manager wants me to recruit a database administrator, well, I'm going into the knowledge and skills, and I said, okay, well, I'm looking for somebody who has basic um, database you know, management operation experience. I'm looking for somebody who has demonstrated in interpersonal skills, problem solving, um, must be, you know, be able to multitask, and must have a background check. Now, that's kind of a general generalization of it, but when you're looking for jobs, you always want to look at the knowledge and skills. Okay, because that's what the recruiter is looking for, that's what the recruiter is talking to the hiring manager, manager about, and that's what's gonna help you be a success in that particular position. Now, you'll take a risk, maybe you won't have everything, but if you don't have everything, how, does the, how do the experiences that you have today translate or transfer over to the job that you're actually trying to apply to? Does that make sense? Okay. Anyone else have any other questions about that? Yeah, sure. You referred several times about taking things back to the manager and the manager. And in my experience, the manager is either super busy or doesn't really know what he's doing or as a is, um, you know, he's working to the company with something like this, but isn't necessarily interested in what mm -hmm. you learn or what you bring back or any of that kind of stuff. So, can I? What's the advice on that, maybe? Yeah. Um, managers are very busy, um, and I think that you guys are very busy as well. Um, but it's important that you take ownership of your career. So if it means, I know that the per, um, performance evaluations actually have a section on there that talks about your career steps, right? Does that still exist here at Berkeley? Okay. Um, it talks about, you know, what are your goals for next year? And then what is the professional development that you want to try to acquire within the next year? And so you should be having conversations with your manager about that. And if you're not, you need to be you know, asking your manager, when am I gonna get my performance evaluation? You know, can I sit down and talk to you about my performance? It's up to you to make that person talk. You know, may, if they don't wanna talk, well, you've done, you've done what you can do. And then you need to take a look at the things that you need to do for yourself and your career. And if it means that, you know, with the manager, maybe it's sending them a report, you know, on a monthly basis or a quarterly basis, hey, guess what, this is what I'm doing, and this is what I'm doing outside of that to help me grow in this particular job. Um, I do know that managers are very busy, but it, it, it is up to, it, it's, it's not a bad thing for you to reach out to your manager to say, hey, listen, this is my career path, this is what I'm trying to accomplish, I'm, wanna, I'm in this department to stay, but I'm also wanting to grow. And so I think managers are open to that. And hopefully, you know, in talking to your manager and opening up with that dialogue, they will be a little bit more, you know, agreeable to the things that you want to talk about. Yes? Um, well, it's interesting, like when you were on the, you know, level, professional level two, professional level three, four kind of thing, um, that, like, I'm a two personally, and the people that are threes in my department all have outside VP experience before mm -hmm. coming in here. And it, it, 
one reason why I want to do this machine passing is because I see it, what I see from my, from my perspective is that in order to get to three or four, you have to leave here to get experience and then come back with world experience. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a, that's a very good observation. I have observed that myself. I think that, um, you know, as far as what you can do to move forward, you should still move forward. If there are classes or projects or things that you can connect yourself with to move to that next level, then you need to be having those conversations with that manager and talking about these are the things I want to I want to put in my path so I can move to that next level. And if, you know, if I can get there, you know, how, how fast can I get there? And what things do I need to have as far as the competency so that I will be a skilled person and I will know that I'm going to be a success in that next level? And they should be talking to you about that. Anyone have any comments or feedback for, for any of these, convers these, these questions and things? I mean, I've been on the UC Berkeley campus for a while, and so I do know... Um, that it, you know, we are very, it's very busy. Um, but with this structure, I think it ha it's been in place. And I asked, you know, how many of you remember this career compass structure? And not a lot of folks raised their hands. So this stuff is still out there. So you do need to go to the J Berkeley Job Builder and take a look at it and bring it back and have some open conversations with folks. This is the piece, another piece that recruiters look at is, is the KSAs. We take a look at the KSAs and the responsibilities. So in the responsibilities, this is kind of an activity that if you were to take one of the training classes for recruitment, you would go through. But it says provide instruction and guidance to less experienced staff, serve as a work leader or supervisor as needed. And then I would take a look as a recruiter at the KSA, you know, ability to develop collaborative work and relationships with diverse populations in an academic setting. From that, I'm talking to the manager about what competencies I'm looking at in this person that I'm interviewing. I want to make sure they have good communication skills and that when I'm speaking to them, they're going to be able to, to, to communicate back to the people that they're going to manage. Um, service focus, making sure they understand that we are um, trying to provide good customer service and um, we want to make sure that our people are also doing that as well and being able to communicate that. I'm looking for a leader and I'm looking for someone who does, has teamwork. So as you're looking at those different job fields and families, not only are you going to look at the knowledge, skills, and abilities and the responsibilities, but you're also going to look at the competencies that are important. What does KSA stand for? Knowledge, skills, and ability. Thank you. Okay. And I believe on the um, job descriptions for you guys is just knowledge and skills. So future exploration. So let's talk about you're exploring, you know, our, as, uh, what jobs are actually out there. Now you know what the jobs are across the organization in the, in the career compass. You're going to share your career goals and your interests with your manager. Um, and you're going to network future projects. So you're going to figure out what those trends are and you're going to connect yourself to those different trends and figure out, you know, can I go and attend a workshop that's happening in a different department or a different unit? Can I meet somebody through the mentor program? How can I make those networking connections so that I can figure out what's going on on this campus and move myself into, an, into a, another position or actually grow in my current job in creating projects or things that would help us move the organization forward? And then you want to keep your resume updated, actually. So we didn't, John Wilton didn't talk about this, but this is actually the movement that's happened on the UC Berkeley campus since 2010, I believe. And if you take a look at it, it takes the different job fields and families, and it talks about you know, what kind of movement has actually come about so far and, and the mobility of what's going on. In the last two years, almost 20% of the staff have had new job opportunities on the UC Berkeley campus. 877 employees, which is 12% of the staff, received a promotional opportunity. And 494 employees, which is 7% of the staff, received a job enrichment opportunity, moving them from a different job or a different department. So if you can't really see exactly what it is, but I can tell you the, 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 the bars that have the, the most yellow in them are the promotion within the same field. The blue is the promotion between different fields. That first field that you see is student services. There were 110 promotions within student services and 31 people moved between different job fields. General administration had promotions, research administration, finance had promotions of 60 people, information technology had 77, and um, external affairs 55, human resources uh, 55 as well. 
So though, there is some movement that's happening. And the fact that we have Career Compass on this campus now, we're able to see how people are moving through the organization. So that, that's the information uh, for, that's happened since 2010. Job enrichments as well. So this is job enrichments, as you know, enrichment between different job fields and families and, and, and also within the same job field and family. And so you want to take a, take a look at what's actually happened on the campus here as well. Again, we're hitting those same fields. Um, um, technology information, general administration, student services has a lot of growth, um, finance, HR, external affairs, engineering, um, research administration as we go down, and then um, there's uh, school, uh, school and rec uh, sports and recreation, communications, general services, research laboratory, education services, facilities, performing arts, library services, healthcare, museum services, and security and public safety. So as you can see, the, 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 the jobs and fields and families that have a lot of opportunities right now are that technology, finance, HR. And a lot of that's going into the Shared Service Center now, and there, there, there's a lot of movement there as well. But HR and um, technology uh, and, and within student affairs have a lot of, a lot of different movement. Any questions regarding those? Yes. Um, this is saying that they moved to a different job altogether. Like, yeah, these are that what I just showed you. These are actual. This is promotions. These are promotions for career staff and contract staff, and these are enrichments and people moving. Yes, Kathy. Phew, that's a big question. Um, that is a trend, um, and since I'm not on the Berkeley campus um, today, um, I can talk a little bit about the trend in moving to contracts. So when you get into a situation um, and being in the workforce for a number of years, when the workforce takes a downturn, basically, in the recession that we're kind of coming out of, companies, um, move from career or permanent opportunities to contract type opportunities. And the reason that is is because they want to make themselves um, strategic in whatever industry that they're particularly in. So you bring in the folks that are going to help move you forward or sustain you and where you need to sustain while this economy shakes itself out. And so those people come in onto, into, into contract positions. Um, I think when I first came into the workforce, I came in as a contract person myself. Um, not in this particular campus, but I came in as a contract person myself, and the economy wasn't that good. But as I stayed in that contract position, things kind of leveled out and stabled, you know, stabilization kind of happened, and then the permanent opportunities kind of opened up. And so that trend I'm speaking in, in a broad aspect of how that works in, in, in business and that you bring in contract people to make sure you're strategic, make sure you're still remaining competitive with the workforce that's out there. Those are people that are coming in maybe that are very experienced versus those that are coming in at an entry level necessarily. Um, and that's just so that you can get that knowledge that you need, that hard, hardcore knowledge to move you forward to sustain you, basically. Um, Berkeley, I know with the um, operational excellence, had a lot of folks move over into contract positions. Those are projects. Those projects need to um, you know, get implemented and stabilize and move the workforce forward, actually. And so um, you know, I don't know how those will shake out as far as moving into to career positions, but I would think once you establish a new project and a new part of the business, that those things will stable out and those career positions will also follow. No, these are for UC Berkeley. You're got, you guys are the only ones that have the career compass actually in place so that we can actually see the movement. Nobody else in the system can see the movement. I mean, we've tried and we've, we have some numbers that talk about people moving from campus to campus, but it's very hard to see the movement between the fields because they're just, they're not mapped, they're not there. Am I good with time? Okay. All right, so let's talk a little bit about, any other questions? That was a good question. Thank you, Kathy. <laughs> yes. Is there a 
Well, I think that to say you want to see movement in your organization means that you've got people out there that are helping you move forward, right? Um, they're, they're taking new opportunities. They're taking new risk. They're creating new, new things for the organization. 20% to say 20% of your workforce is moving, that's, that's pretty significant, I think. I think, you know, if, you know, the, the average turnover rate in any organization that or the organizations that I think about for me that I've been in is like 12% of the workforce leaves the organization, right? Um, and that's kind of the turnover rate. And I think, I wish Rich were here, but I think that that was kind of the turnover rate that we were seeing on Berkeley campus when I was here. And so 12% to see you're seeing 12% turnover, that means they're leaving the organization. But now we've, we're seeing 20% that's movement within the organization and they're staying here. That means they're growing their careers, they're having you know, opportunities, they're, they're setting themselves up for good career path mobility. And I think that that's a great thing that the, the, the Career Compass actually created for you guys. Okay, so the different ways that you can actually move. I talked about the climbing wall and I brought Brooke into the conversation because she's a risk taker, number one. But I also think that the climbing wall can be an, anal an analogy or a metaphor for your career movement that you actually have, right? So if I wanna get to the top of that rock or the top of that mountain or whatever I'm climbing, there's always that vertical climb that goes straight up. And a lot of that vertical climb is, um, is happens still here today, not, not as much at the top as, as it used to be, but that vertical climb is really important within that career path that we talked about with the uh, career compass, where you start at the level one and you move up to the level five. That's an important piece and that's part of the vertical climb and we're gonna hear a, a career story about that today. Um, the lateral movement is really the new promotions right now. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about what, what it means to move laterally in an organization. What does it mean to have enrichment and kind of grow in place in where you are? Um, how do you realign yourself if you're figuring you're in a position and things are changing and this isn't the right fit for you anymore? How do you realign yourself to make sure you're, you're back in a, in a good place? And explore, you know, maybe what's outside the organization, as you just mentioned. Um, you know, some people leave the organization and then they come back. And there have been tons and tons of stories that I've heard regarding that. So the vertical move up. Lots of people take that vertical move up for more compensation, for more status, and for more responsibilities, basically. And so this is, this is us on our career ladder moving up, up this. When I first joined um, the workforce in the 80s and 90s, you know, companies used to hire you straight out of school and they'd put you into big development programs and they'd say, you know, in the next X number of years, you're gonna move up. I started my career at a, a consulting firm and the moment I walked in, they handed me my career plan, here you go. And um, I felt like I was back in college again because I, they wanted to know, you know, what I was gonna do in the next year, what kind of classes I was gonna take in the next year, what kind of networking was I going to do in the next year, and then what was my three-year plan? And at the end of that first year that I had in that, at that consulting firm, they came back and said, okay, well, you didn't get to take, you know, training for behavioral interviewing, and well, why didn't you do that? Well, I didn't have time. Well, then that's a reflection on my manager because my manager didn't allow me to go do that training that I needed to do to move to that next step. We don't necessarily have development programs like that anymore, but you can create your own program that looks like that. You know, what do you have on your career plan? What are the classes you need to take? What are the networks you need to make? How are you gonna make those jumps to the next department or to the next unit? Maybe I don't wanna do that. How can I take the department I'm in right now a step further and help UC Berkeley grow? So that's a really important piece in, in that vertical climb up. Um, then there's lateral moves across. Um, sometimes you can't, catch, you can't catch that right grip to move straight up. Sometimes you have to move vertically. Um, a lot of times the, the, the positions at the very top, um, they, they don't come available a lot. So it's okay to take a lateral move. A lateral move can be a lateral move within UC Berkeley. It can be a lateral move within another UC, within UCOP, within UCSF, within UC Davis. It's, it, these are excellent opportunities for you to expand your growth. It, it, uh, lateral moves, explore, it, um, 
Lateral moves actually help you uh, meet new people, expose you to new managers, they expand your portfolio. Um, you know, you move into areas that have high growth and, and, and are fast paced moving. Um, they help gain new competencies, basically. Um, enrichment and growing in place. So maybe the move moving to the side and moving straight up wasn't for you. Maybe you just want to hang and you want to look at, it, look at the, your path up in a different way. And so, you know, you want to be asking your questions you, you, to yourself, you know, how can I um, make my job more satisfying where I'm at right now today? Um, what do I enjoy most about this job and, and what I do on a daily basis? And how can I do more of that? And so this actually sparks a lot of creativity within departments and within groups, and they end up creating some really great things, such as the NOW conference that you're at right now today. And so um, it's, it's an excellent opportunity, and I think UC Berkeley really has the stomach to allow people to do that and actually grow in place. And I think it's a very, very important thing that you do regardless of where you are in your path. Um, sometimes, like I mentioned, um, my story about my, um, my colleague who was a, um, um, a, a generalist um, who had to take a step back because her family situation had changed. Sometimes you need to take a step back to maybe realign yourself. Maybe it's not family that's doing that. Maybe it's like, you know what, I think I want to go into project management. I've been in HR for a while. I've run a lot of projects. How can I go look at the career compass job fields and families and decide, you know, wh what kind of, where do I want to land as far as project management goes? And maybe I go take a project management class and maybe I go and I take a step back to a position, you know, that's maybe a, a, a one level or two level below where I'm at right now today. And then I go and I do this project management opportunity and then as opportunities grow and I'm expanding, expanding my, my position in project management, maybe I find another opportunity in some other place and I move into another role and then I continue to move up. So there are lots of different ways that you can realign yourself in, um, in, in, in your career. And then somebody mentioned, you know, what can I, what about moving outside of the organization? Yeah, there might be some opportunities to relocate, but I ask you, if you decide to do that, you know, we always think the grass is greener on the other side. Come back and ask yourself, what is it going on right now in your life, in your particular position that makes you want to look outside right now? Um, and then what kind of, you want to also ask yourself, what kind of relationships do you have established here? and be thinking about what kind of relationships you will have to establish as you walk outside this organization and being able to identify that, what works for you and what doesn't work. Because you know, making a big move from UC Berkeley is a humongous thing. I moved to UCOP thinking, ah, oh, it's still higher education, no big deal. They have the same policies and do the same things, right? So the, there, shouldn't be any op there shouldn't be any change. Well, it's a big change. When I moved from UC Berkeley to OP, I, luckily I've worked in a corporate environment before. I was like, oh yeah, this is the corporate thing that's going on here. Yeah, we're still connected to higher education. Oh yeah, we still got those policies that I you know, have to be responsible for on UC Berkeley campus, but it's different. It's very, very different. So please, 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 if you're making those changes, do your research on that and make sure you understand what that culture's about and um, the type of people who work there. Um, same thing going if you're going to another you know, campus. The funny stories that I've heard for, for, career track, or for career track stories that we're talking about now is that, well, every campus thinks they're the best campus. You know, so when you get there and you start saying, well, at Berkeley we did blah, 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 they look at you, well, we don't do that at UCLA. And so I don't know why you keep bringing up Berkeley because you're at UCLA now, so get with it. And so the thing is, is that you have to understand, oh, yes, hello, I'm in a new culture. I'm in a new environment. We're all one you see, but I'm in a new environment. And so you want to make sure you understand that. We don't actually have time for the um, activity, but if you look in your packet on the other side, um, you had two sheets of paper. One says my career blueprint. And so in that career blueprint, um, there are different columns. And the very first column, are gonna, you're going to put down the things that you think are important for you to make a transition to a new um, opportunity. Or you're going to put things that are important where you are today, right? So I think, and for me, it's the company, it's the industry that I'm in, um, the culture that's, um, that I just kind of mentioned a moment ago, the people, and then the work, for, the work tasks that I actually have to do. And you can keep going on and on on the different things that are important to you. 
but I want you to have three, you know, four columns. One says, this is the things I absolutely want in my next move, right? And the next column is, these are the things that I, I don't want in the next move. And the next column is, these are the things that I must have. And then the next one is the frivolous or fun, the things that I, I think that are gonna make my life happy as I'm at the top of that, that, that rock, right? So in people, I maybe I, I put, I want uh, I, to work with well, um, bright, well, bright and well-educated folks. What I don't want is I don't want long periods with no customer contact. That's not kind of how Kelly works. And then what I must have, I must work with ethical people that I can trust because that's really important to me. And then the frivolous or fun is I, hopefully I work with people that have a sense of humor because sometimes I think I do have a sense of humor. <laughs> and so um, I think that that's very important. And so as you take a moment, you can go through this when you get back to your, to your, your home offices and you can go through that and, and put your blueprint together. We talked a little bit about investigating the possibilities of what other UCs do. Um, the, all the UCs have tons and tons of opportunities to get the community involved. If you're thinking about UCLA, or you're thinking about UC Davis, or you're thinking about UCOP, we have a speaker series. You could come and check that out if you wanted to. You could figure out ways to connect yourself with those people in your particular industry. Now, if you're in finance, maybe finance is having something at a, one of the particular UCs. Maybe HR is doing something really cool on one of the UC campuses, and you can connect with those people now and um, be able to explore that and then move yourself into a new job or into a new project. Um, career success, you know, uh, is your own personal definition, no matter where you land. It's not, are you at a director level, are you at a manager level, are you at an analyst, you know, are you at a, a finance person's level three or four? It's all where you land and, and, and it's important to you. So ask yourself these questions. How do you define career success? What kind of work do you do or you want to be doing? What do you want to, what do you want to achieve? What talents do you yearn to leverage or activate? What, is, what about you makes you want to move? What about you is important? Um, you know, where do you see yourself in the next two, five, and, or even 10 years? And with whom and under what circumstances will you be working? And how, and, you know, how do you want, what do you want to be doing, basically? So the advantage of moving from one campus to another, we're all one UC. We all have the same policies. Yeah, and sometimes we have the same procedures in getting those things accomplished. But you do, like I mentioned before, you do want to remember they have their own culture there. And they all think they're the best. And we all think we're the best. And so you want to be aware of, as you move into those different cultures that, um, that they do do things differently. And you will have to adapt. And you will have to learn. But it's a great experience. Um, we have some success stories that we're going to hear. And they have moved all over UC, you know, from down south to up north to Berkeley to UCOP. There's tons of different opportunities there. And you should explore them. Good. The last thing I want to talk to you about is creating an action plan. On the opposite side of that blueprint is an action plan. You can fill this out, take this back, think about what you're gonna do, take a look at the career compass job bills and families, take a look at the competencies and the knowledge and skills that you need to have to move on, and fill this out. This is a great way for you to kind of put your plan to, in, into place. You know, what's your mission? What is your long-term or your short-term career goal? You know, target experiences that you need to have to move yourself to that next level, that level three that the young lady was talking about. Target competencies that you need to make sure you are um, boning up on, and, and you get that through your skills and the attributes that you um, have, acquire. Um, developmental goals under action plan at the bottom, um, the action steps you need to take, the resources that you need, and then the constraints that are going to keep you from getting to those resources, and how do you move those, those blocks and climb that mountain, um, and then the target dates and what deadline do you want to achieve those things. Any questions about that form? Okay. Because now I'd like to talk about um, how you find jobs. Um, there is a UC system-wide job board that's actually out there now if you haven't noticed it. It has all the UCs attached to it. It has UC PATH attached to it in Riverside, which is a kind of a new, a new opportunity for a lot of folks. You can go on here, take a look at it, um, find the positions and the opportunities that you're interested in. And then, oh, sure. This is online. I don't know. Um, it, I think it's UC, I think it's UC, um, UC Jobs. I don't know. I, I'll, I'll get that for you, though. 
Google it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, no, I actually, um, you know, it, y most of the websites, so if you went to UC Berkeley's website, there is a link to this actual site, landing site. So you could actually find it that way. And I do think it's, it's um, UC Jobs. It's like a long name, UC Jobs something, something. Yeah. If you go to UCOP's website, our website actually brings you to this page first, and then you click in to go to the office of the president. Yeah. No, not yet. We're working on it. We're working on that, actually, because um, it would be great, right? And we, all of those, all of these people, people who apply to these jobs, they're all individuals, so there's not like one pool for everybody. And so um, I definitely, you definitely want to um, to explore all of that. But we're working on that, so it'll, it'll be coming soon. I'd like to spend some time because I'm going to give, I have 10 minutes left, and I got two wonderful speakers that really need to come up and tell you their career stories. Um, they're connected in, in interesting ways. And so Steve Garber is going to come up and talk a little bit about his success story, and then we will hear from Sierra Iglesias. She will talk as well. Hi, everyone. So um, Kelly asked me to tell my story, and so I'll try to do that enough time because I want to give Sierra a chance to tell hers too. So I um, came to the Berkeley campus just over 11 years ago. Um, I would, my background was in nonprofit administration. I had left my, my previous job and was looking for a new job. Um, and I, had, I actually had two job offers. One was to work in MBA admissions um, here at the Haas School of Business. And the other one was to be the CFO of a very small nonprofit in Berkeley. And I couldn't decide which job I wanted. One was a, one was a big, big fish in a little pond, another was a little fish in a big pond. And I, I really couldn't make up my mind, and so I just let money make, make the decision for me. Um, and so the, the one who offered me just a touch more money was here at UC Berkeley, and so I came here. And I stayed at um, MBA admissions for four years. Um, while I was there, my first four years of, of working at HEARS, I took advantage of every single career development opportunity there was. Um, I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget. I did the Supervisors Development Lab, um, which is now the Keys um, training. I did the Management Skills Assessment Program. I went to Business Officers Institute. I participated with Annette Dishler in the Leadership Development Program. And I was um, a, a mentee in the BSA Mentorship Program the very first year in their pilot. Um, and these were all great opportunities that once I was done with all of this, after four years, I felt ready to move on. I'm like, I'm ready for my, for my next job. And I really wanted to get into HR and finance work. And um, so I, I applied for jobs. And I, I, so my first job was a senior admin analyst. You were talking about the analyst position. So I was a senior admin analyst. It didn't mean anything, but that was the title. And um, I took a, a job as a, a, an MSO2, a Management Services Officer 2, and actually that was a lateral move, but it was in a different field, um, and so that felt like the, the right next step for me. And I got amazing training working in central HR in both H, getting in my HR skills and finance skills. And while I was there, the job got reclassified to an MSO3, so there was my little vertical jump that I was able to take at that point. Um, I stayed in HR for two and a half years, and I was ready for some new challenges, and I um, took a job in the chancellor's office as, um, I can't remember the title at, at the time, but it was, oh, I might say it on my resume. I brought that with me, too. I was the business services director in the <laughs> chancellor's office, and that was, um, that was actually another step up into what was then called the director, director one position. Um, and while I was in the chancellor's office, I was overseeing budget, finance, and HR for the whole chancellor's office. And while I was there is when Career Compass happened, and I was able to my, get my job class, reclassified as an administrative manager one. Um, and this is when all the changes started happening on campuses, when, this, when the cutbacks were happening. And um, I realized at the time that in order for, for me to be able to, to stay within the chancellor's office in my job, I had to start doing other things outside the chancellor's office. And I offered, um, after talking with my boss, to offer those starting off, offering those services to other departments related to the chancellor's office. I was the vice chancellor administration and finance immediate office. I was providing services to, sh to the shared services folks. 
to the OE program office, um, and I was able to expand my skill set um, by, by working in these different offices. Um, it also started becoming clear that it, what, what's going to happen with my job? Here, here come shared, shared services. What does that mean for me? Am I going to be stuck in a shared services center out of, if I don't want to be there? Um, maybe I am interested in shared services. I didn't really know, but I didn't want that decision to be made for me. I want to make the decision about where I want to be with my career. Um, and I decided, you know what, I, in or, if, I, I, I decided that probably I don't want to work off campus. I want to stay on campus. So I um, started looking for a new job, and I, um, almost a year ago, in April of the year, I took a job as an administrative manager one in educational technology services. So again, it was another lateral move. However, it was in a whole different world. I'm now working in a technology organization. Um, we're a recharge operation, so I'm learning about recharge. Um, and it was just, it was the, the right step at the right time, and so, um, now I'm looking at shared services, and I'll be a client of shared services. My job is not going to shared services. However, I'm, I'm losing a couple of my staff to shared services. Um, so what does that mean for me in the next year? How is my job going to change? I'm no longer going to be supervising these functions, but be the liaison to these functions. So this is something I'm thinking about now. Um, and so Kelly asked me to, to provide advice to folks about, you know, what, what do I advise you in terms of your career? Um, network. Network, network, network. It could be as simple as going out to lunch with a friend um, or participating in a staff org. I've, I've been very active in the Berkeley Staff Assembly, which was, allowed me to become active in the Council of UC Staff Assemblies, which is the system-wide organization, and I'm actually now chair of that organization. It was through the staff org that I was able to now have the system-wide role where I'm meeting quarterly with President Udoff and with the executive um, um, Vice President Nathan Brostrom, and meeting with different delegates across the campus. You know, part of the reason why I want to be here today is I want to be able to sell something like this to system-wide. Every campus at UC should be doing something like this, not UC Berkeley. And so that's something I'm going to be using my networks and my connections to try to send the message elsewhere. Um, take training opportunities. You know, I, one thing I didn't mention is I, I participated in the um, financial management certificate program. I'm not really sure if that's happening right now, but it was an opportunity to, to learn some skills in finance, but also prove to myself that, yes, I had the skills necessary. Um, and just get, get involved in any way you can. You know, when you're invited, say yes. Um, so here I am saying yes up on this stage today. Um, and so now I'm starting to think about, you know, I want to stay where I am now for a while, but what are my next steps? I'm always thinking ahead to that, that path. Do I want to be an assistant dean somewhere? Do I want to be a director of a program? Do I want to be an executive advisor to a vice chancellor? Do I want to be a chief of staff in the chancellor's office? These are all things I can continue to think about as I think about my career and next steps. Kelly, how do you move the slide? Is it not an arrow? <laughs> um, hi, everyone. While Kelly is moving my slide, I'm Sierra Iglesia. And Kelly had mentioned briefly that Steve and I um, are connected. And what's funny is I didn't even know that Steve was going to be here uh, today. When Kelly asked me to come, I was just like hesitant. But I said, sure, I'll come um, and tell my story. But um, Steve actually hired me when I was a student here at UC Berkeley, so um, that was really funny. We were just talking about before this conference started that um, I remember being in the office and having my interview with him and being nervous and sitting on the chair and, you know, answering the questions, and I was just joking with him saying um, that he was like, okay, I need you to stay here all four years as a student, because um, I was coming in as a freshman, and I was like, okay, I can make that commitment, and I'm still here um, past being a student, so, yeah, we can blame Steve for that. No. <laughs> So, um, as I mentioned, I actually have, was at Berkeley for six years, if you count um, my student years in that one, and then I actually also accepted a position at UC Office of the President um, last summer, so it'll be almost a year um, this summer. 
Um, I started out though as a student with um, Central HR. So um, that was when Steve was the MSO he had just mentioned. Um, so the exposure that I got as a student was being the receptionist at the front desk, you know, greeting um, people when they came in, answering questions. But really it was good um, foundation for me because then I learned about all the different areas within HR. I kind of got a general um, knowledge about them. So I, I learned a little bit about how to apply um, on the jobs website um, from Kelly, learned some about what of our what are our benefits, you know, what, what are unions, so learning a little bit about um, labor relations. Um, and then compensation, that was when career tracks um, was rolling out, was when I was a student, so I, I never even knew what classification was or job structure was, so it just kind of um, had me exposed. And I also did um, meet just, you know, different people, a lot of people come in and out of Central HR for meetings and dropping off documents, and it was just really good exposure to the UC campus as a whole, um, working in a central function. So after, um, when I was a student, my senior year, then um, Shared Service Center was coming out the HR Center. So um, it opened in 2010, yeah, 2010. Um, and so they were like, hey, there's this um, center opening. You should apply. You're graduating in May. Um, and I was like, uh, okay, yeah, I, I like HR. I want to learn more. Um, I kind of have this foundation knowledge, but I haven't really honed in and um, dived into any one specific area in HR. So I accepted a position um, as assistant to the director. So um, I was the assistant and she was the HR director. And so being her assistant, um, I did primarily administrative functions, you know, managing calendars, um, also sat at the front desk at the HR center over in U-Haul. Um, but then really being assistant to the director, um, she would get escalated cases come through, right, because she was the director. So any kind of escalated case, um, cases on labor relations, employee relations, compensation, recruiting, those would all come through her desk. And so if she was ever backlogged, you know, she would ask me, can you go look into so-and-so or look into this um, specific process example, you know, rehire, retiree. I didn't know that there was a policy for that. So I had to go read up on that because we had an interesting case about that. So it really got me the exposure to escalated cases and um, through that and then also because she was a director she would backfill if any of the senior HR business partners um, were on vacation or out on a leave so then that would fall back on her to support that client group and so the client group would you know call me first to get a hold of her and you know tell me the issue or what was going on so then that's kind of how I naturally learned some of those um, cases that came through so then there was an opportunity that they created um, some new positions in the HR center list uh, in the HR center uh, they opened a position for kind of the entry-level generalist and so because I had been working under the director and and did get so much exposure um, with her then I did have kind of that background um, HR knowledge so I applied for the position and received the position it was in the same department but it was a promotion um, and to get ready for that position you know I made sure and throughout um, the time that I was assistant um, I read whatever I could get my hands on. So the HR web is, if you are in the HR um, field, it's a really good resource. I read through that guide to managing human resources and really familiarized myself with it, read through the different union contracts and P PPSM and, um, and those contracts. Um, so I did get a lot of knowledge just on HR and the resources that are on our website. Berkeley's been here for so long and we do have all these tools and resources at our fingertips um, that sometimes we can take for granted. So I wanted to make sure I read through those and then also you see offers all these classes. So I did um, take classes here. You know, you can even take um, access or project or um, um, even ones like that. I'm getting the hurry up. So um, <laughs> then I became an HR journalist and just through attrition, um, then I got more and more responsibility on me because some of the senior HR business partners had left. So then I um, eventually got be, um, to become the primary contact for um, my own department. So to kind of do more of the HR, I was just doing like recruiting and compensation and early uh, or like entry level generalist work. So then I got to have the more specialized and then I escalated any issues that came up if I wasn't really familiar with it, if it was some, you know, touchy-feely like labor relations or employee relations case. So I did that and then because I was at the HR Center, it was a new organization, it was startup, um, we did get to define a lot of processes and then um, figure out what wasn't really working and go in and make those even more efficient and kind of um, redo those. So then I realized that that's really like what I'm interested in is 
finding a process and then uh, making that process more efficient and figuring out how we can do it differently. So then when I heard about the UC Path project um, through UCOP is sponsoring, um, that's when I applied for that position. Um, and I don't know if you know about UC Path, but it's for, um, we're gonna implement a new payroll and HR information system for the whole UC um, system wide. So I know we have PPS right now, but we have different instances of PPS for each campus and Berkeley and a couple other campuses are the only one who have HCM, if you know that. It's the HR information system. And so we're going to have that. It's a PeopleSoft program for the whole system. Um, and also we'll open a shared service center for the whole um, system and we'll do HR transactions um, and payroll transactions through there. So. I got hired to staff um, for that center that is going to be in Riverside um, and also to start working on those type of you know, HR processes and figure out how to make those more efficient in doing business process maps and um, new tools and learning so much every day. So um, that's kind of been my quick career path uh, through UC Berkeley and now to Office of the President. So here's Kelly again. Thank you um, for your attention that you've given today. Um, if there are questions, I can answer those. I know that we're, we are right at time and, and lunch is at 12. But I, I definitely want to encourage you guys to take a look at your career paths. Think about the skills and the, and, and the knowledges and the things that you need to gain. Think about Brooke and how she climbed that rock and what kind of risk taker she was. And so think about what those risks you, can, you actually want to move forward with. Because you guys are your boss. You just need to get to the top of whatever rock you need to get there. Okay? I'm at UCOP. If you need to contact me, you can contact me through LinkedIn because my UCOP address is busy. <laughs> but um, I definitely would love to stay connected with you all.